All right, I think we can get going again. So I just welcome Jürgen. Uh, thank, thank you. Who's working with me at Western Digital, talking about CXL. Yep. So um, these are just uh, this talk about, is about some experiences we've had with uh, playing around with uh, CXL on uh, on Linux uh, using uh, QEMU. And uh, as Hans mentioned, um, my name is uh, Jörn, and I work at Western Digital Research in the Copenhagen office. So. The agenda for the talk is first a very quick introduction to CXL, and then we'll look a little bit closer at CXL memory devices, because that's what we have been playing around with. And then moving on to uh, how emulation of CXL works in QEMU. And finally, just uh, a few things on how you can, like, like the tools you can use to, to look at CXL memory on a Linux system. So first, the introduction. So uh, CXL, or Compute Express Link, it's uh, an interconnect for uh, providing coherent access between uh, memory from uh, or CPUs and accelerators and memory expanders. And so basically, the coherent part is uh, that the CPU can access memory on a device uh, coherently, meaning it can cache it and so on, and also we want accelerators to be able to read directly from CPU attached memory and uh, cache uh, content from the uh, from the uh, CPU attached memory. So if you just look at a system with PCIe only, you have the CPUs over here. They're trying to access some uh, memory attached to an accelerator, for example, a GPU, and they have to do that uh, with uh, uncached memory access. You can have some uh, the accelerators in the middle are trying to uh, access the CPU memory. They have to use uh, DMA to move data back and forth. And then we have some NICs over here that wants to store data into uh, some um, accelerator attached memory. And they also have to, to use, uh, well, they actually have to use peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, PCIe operations to to do that. So with uh, CXL, the idea is that uh, the CPU can now access uh, the accelerator back memory with uh, regular load store operations in a, uh, uh, and uh, using write back memory, uh, like it does with uh, regular CPU attached memory. So there should be no difference in the way the CPUs are accessing memory, regardless of where it's located on the interconnect. The accelerators, they can now access CPU attached memory just um, and cache data on the GPUs. They can use load store as well. And the PCIe cards over here can now use DMA to the uh, accelerator memory as well. So one of the, like, so you can say there's like two main things. One is that we want to simplify or make uh, accelerators more efficient in the way they access system resources. Uh, and also, you want to be able to provide the CPUs with more memory that they can, uh, so you essentially scale the memory uh, bandwidth potentially by having both CPU attached and interconnect attached memory, um, and also just in, uh, expand the memory footprint. And so CXL is just a protocol it, uh, built on top of uh, the PCIe Express uh, physical and electrical layers. So in essentially, you can have a PCIe card in a, in a system that also supports CXL. But if you have a CXL card, it can be recognized as CXL and added to the system as a CXL device. So in CXL, you distinguish between three different kinds of devices. You have accelerators without memory. That's a type 1 device. It uses uh, two out of three sub-protocols in CXL. CXL I.O. is just regular device I.O., uh, similar to PCIe. And then you have CXL cache, which is, which is for accessing host memory from a device. And then you can have a cache on the device itself where you store 
uh, memory read from the host system or the processor attached memory, and then you will get invalidations if, or well, I mean, it will be part of the coherent uh, memory and will get invalidations or sharing notifications and so on. So one example of uh, an accelerator without memory could be a smart NIC, like at least memory that's exposed as memory to the, to the processor. Then we can have uh, the second type, type two, which is accelerators with memory. And one example here would be a GPU. As before, you can have the GPU accessing data on the CPU attached memory. You have CXLIO. And then you have CXL.mem, which is a protocol for allowing the processor to access uh, device memory uh, coherently. And then the final type is the type 3 memory, which is uh, type 3 device, which is the memory expander, which is just uh, pure memory. Hi, Hans. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, and this is what we're going to look more closely at in the following uh, slides, since this is basically what we're looking at today. Um, and I mean today, and not as right now, but in this recent period of time. So CXL type 3 memory, there's a, a been a, an evolution of what is uh, supported in the standard as memory uh, expansion, different ways. Uh, the first one uh, we're going to look at is the what is specified in CXL 1.1, which is also basically what you potentially can get your hands on today in terms of actual devices. So everything that's coming after this is only specified, not really, um, well, there are devices maybe that will support 2.0, but, uh, but there's not a lot of uh, hardware that out there that supports anything beyond CXL 1.1. So these uh, devices are a single, single device memory extender. So basically you have a device, it can participate in a hierarchy, like a device hierarchy for a given a single host. It can be uh, connected and exposed as uh, a memory-only NUMA node uh, on the host system. The BIOS is responsible for detecting and bringing up the memory, so you don't need a lot of uh, operating system support to, to get to this stage, where you can have uh, access to these uh, memory expanders. There's some support for interleaving, meaning that you can uh, but over parallel links to the same device, so you can spread out the traffic across multiple links, but um, well that's about it. And there's no support for hot plug in uh, CXL 1.1. So this allows you to expand the memory of a single system, but uh, hyperscalers and other like big clusters, uh, men, uh, operators are interested in maybe having a better utilization of the memory they put in the system. So today, if you look at a hyperscaler, maybe 50, 60 percent of the cost of a of a node is the memory you put into the node. So if you can be more efficient in how you use the memory, and that would be uh, a big cost saving. So in CXL 2.0. We're introducing the concept of, or CXL introduced the concept of memory pools, where you can have multiple hosts connected through a switch to multiple CXL devices. Each of these devices will can then have multiple logical devices, so they are MLDs or multi-logical devices, and each of these logical devices can be assigned to a host. So before, where we just had these separate hierarchies, now you can have individual hosts connecting to logical devices, creating a virtual hierarchy across the switch, uh, so that each of these devices you can be configured to say, OK, you have one logical device here. You get maybe one gig of memory from this device assigned to, to this logical device, and then you can uh, provide that device to the to to a host and it will and then another part of the the physical memory in this device can be assigned to another host. So in that way you can you have some um, you, 
You can reconfigure the memory layout of your system uh, for the different hosts. It's not really, you shouldn't think of it as like an on-demand thing where you can just uh, continuously fine-tune things. It's still, a given configuration is tied to a logical device, so if you want to change the amount of memory exposed by a logical device, you would have to do basically a hot unplug and plug of that device so that it would uh, reappear with a new configuration, and that could also require maybe some changes to, I mean, depending a little bit on, on what you do, you might even need to, to go through a host reboot to reinitialize the, the routing for the CXL part. But still, I mean, it's better than before. Each of these devices can, uh, like an MLD, can support up to 16 hosts. And uh, now you can also support interleaving of memory access across devices. So if you want to increase the bandwidth from a given host, you can say, OK, I want to spread it out with, uh, for some kind of grain size so that the, the actual memory, uh, contiguous memory in the host will be, uh, will be uh, uh, partitioned among the, the participating uh, uh, or the configured uh, memory expanders. So the routing in the switch is based on, so you establish these virtual hierarchies, and within the virtual hierarchies, you have uh, uh, host addresses tied uh, for, for each individual host. So the actual routing to the devices is based on uh, the memory accesses from the host. You say, OK, this part of the memory is, is, is uh, tied to this device. Part of it is to this and part to that. So then you'll, you'll program uh, what is called decoders in the, in the switch and in the devices to, to do the routing. So to configure all this, there are some APIs in, this, in the spec. Uh, you have a notion of a fabric manager, which is the one that is responsible for setting up things. Um, so the APIs are there. The actual sort of exactly how it's going to work is not covered by the standard itself. You're assuming some outside parties will provide uh, some kind of cluster orchestration tool or whatever to, to, um, to actually do this. So the APIs, the functionality for configuring is there, but not the actual way to, to do it. And then hot plug support was introduced, partly, I guess, because you would need to, to have hot plug support to reconfigure stuff. This also means that, as opposed to CXL 1.1 on 2.0, you need more operating system support. You need to be able to reconfigure the system based on hot plug and unplug. So uh, a lot of the Linux work uh, is directed at supporting CXL 2.0, like kernel work for, for bringing up stuff. So this is all fine. I mean, it's maybe a little bit small scale uh, and also sounds a little bit cumbersome with the, the routing. So in CXL 3.0, they tried to be more generic and say, OK, we, now we're not talking about a single switch. We're talking about a fabric. And you can have, have tons of hosts and uh, memory attached to this fabric. And it can just scale up to uh, 4,095 entities, which is what, well, at least per, per memory device. And instead of uh, routing on host, uh, host physical addresses when you access memory, uh, each device will now have a, uh, an ID. So use port-based routing. The global fabric attached memory, or GFAM, will have a, an, a PPR ID. And then the switches will route accesses to a given memory device using these IDs. And other things introduced in 3.0 was uh, uh, shared memory support with some hardware uh, enforce consistency mechanisms. The intent is not to have like a uh, like a multi like it's not meant for sharing like every all memory. It's it's more the thinking is more like you could have some small segments that are shared between hosts. So, uh, but we'll see what the. I mean, this is all just specs, so we don't really know what the 
what the cost of this consistency, hardware enforced consistency, would be. Another thing is the dynamic capacity devices, where it's easier to shrink and grow uh, the actual allocated memory to a given device. So I mentioned before about hot plug, unplug, and then for dynamic capacity devices, it should be easier to, to rebalance memory between hosts. All right. So let we can take a, clo a closer look at how such a memory device actually looks. So we have uh, some memory capacity. It can be volatile and persistent. There's a, uh, uh, yeah, well, we have some configuration registers that expose what the actual, uh, what, what the capacities are. And then for the persistent memory, we also have what is called this label storage area, which is for uh, persisting configurations of persistent memory. So we talked or mentioned before that you can do some kind of interleaving, for example. So if you have persistent memory that's interleaved, you really want to have it interleaved in the same way the next time you power on the system. So uh, the LSA is for storing the actual configuration of these persistent uh, memory configurations on the persistent memory itself. Um, right, so, so that's the actual uh, memory capacity. Then we have uh, the decoders. The host managed device memory decoder, the HDM decoders, they provide a mapping between the host physical addresses, which is what is coming over the fabric or the interconnect, and then that's mapping to the device physical addresses, which are just like local physical addresses starting at zero for, for the local memory on the device. So we'll have such a decoder on the, on the device itself. And then um, yep. Then we have uh, some configuration registers. There's the designated vendor-specific extended capability, which contains information about the regions, the number of HDM decoders, the protocol supported. I mean, in this case, if it's a memory device, it would just be IO and .mem. But, uh, and then we have the uh, coherent device attribute, the CDAT, which describes the memory, the characteristics of the memory of the device. So you think, well, maybe for different uh, memory expanders, there could be different kinds of memory. So it's not clear what the actual sort of memory performance characteristics of that individual memory would be. You can have multiple devices in the system. They have different characteristics. So you want to be able to sort of monitor what is, what is the the actual characteristics of a given device that's plugged into the system. So if you look at the hierarchy, uh, we were talking about the virtual hierarchy before. Uh, we have a root complex up here. It has, uh, and all this is within a, what is called the fixed memory window for a CXL. So initially when the host is powering on, it's enumerating the firmware, platform firmware is enumerating all the devices and determining, okay, I need a specific uh, host physical address range to accommodate all the devices in the system. So it allocates that, and then that is used for tying in the, the CXL host bridge in the system, or bridges. And then within each uh, host bridge, you have uh, you, you have a bunch of root ports that can be used for attaching devices. And each of those root ports will have a uh, decoder, or there will be a decoder that is controlling how host physical addresses are routed to the different root ports in the bridge. Then you can have a switch where you have upstream and downstream ports. And again, you have decoders to direct the flow of uh, memory operations. And then finally, you have the device down here where you uh, also have decoders, again, to, to map to device physical addresses. And so we talked about uh, this CDAT stuff. So the memory doesn't need to be uniform. So you have, uh, have the CDAT that is processed by the 
the platform firmware that's used to create a couple of tables for use by the operating system. So you have the, the SRAT, the static resource affinity table, which shows the various NUMA domains in the system. So you can have accelerators and memory attached. You have different proximity domains. And then you have the heterogeneous memory attribute table, uh, the HMAT, um, which is uh, basically showing uh, bandwidth and latency between initiators and targets in the system. So that can also be used to create a, um, a model for how memory access is like the NUMA properties of the system are. So if you look at the system, you would normally see CXL memory. Here we have uh, three NUMA nodes, a couple with CPUs and local CPU attached memory. Then we have the CXL memory on a CPU-less uh, NUMA node. Ideally, the cost of accessing the CXL memory should be equivalent to accessing remote memory. Like if it's the same type of memory attached to the, uh, to the memory expander, you would expect that this is, it has similar cost to go to the CXL memory from node zero as going to the memory attached to node one. So in that way, there shouldn't be any additional cost of, uh, of accessing memory over CXL. I mean, there might be a little bit of protocol overhead. And this is just assuming that this, um, that this, if you look at maybe in a, in a 1.1 system, if you start introducing switches and sharing between different hosts, even though CXL has some QoS uh, capabilities, you can still imagine that if, if this is going over some network, well, fabric over fabric, and uh, there can be contention or all kinds of things. So it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit different in that case. But if you just look at a single system, then uh, the expectation is that it, uh, that it should be fairly close to just accessing any other kind of memory that is not local to the CPU. So we did, we do have a few like experimental systems and currently it doesn't really, I mean, it's, it's really not production uh, stuff, so, but it doesn't look like, I mean, that, let's say there's some room for improvement in terms of, of the observed performance. Um, <coughs> Right. So if you're an application, you want to use this. I mean, you already have uh, operations or utilities for, for using uh, memory on different human nodes. You have uh, APIs for applications to say, I want to allocate memory from a given NUMA node. Uh, you can use uh, this NUMA CTL uh, utility to launch uh, an application and say, OK, you, I want you to consume memory from from this NUMA node, for example, so you can direct it at a specific, say, maybe at tied to a CPU and some other memory. If you just look at uh, using CXL memory in a system, uh, using just regular NUMA balancing, what normally happens is that if you uh, if you have a thread running in a CPU, the normal uh, NUMA balancing will try to uh, keep memory access by the thread uh, local to the, to the NUMA node. And so it can try to migrate pages closer to the CPU or the thread if, uh, if there's room. So, but, if, uh, but it might, um, under normal circumstances, there's really not a, like an explicit eviction process uh, for the from the NUMA nodes. So there was initially there were some issues. I, uh, well, well in Linux the NUMA balancing wasn't necessarily uh, managing the the NUMA sorry the CPU-less NUMA nodes, uh, but there have been uh, um, patches in the last couple of well in the last year or so that has been improving the the workflow of all this. So 
Another way to look at CXL memory would be to say, okay, we could have a, a tiered system where we have uh, fast uh, CPU cl uh, close memory and then we have the CXL memory and it's it should be, you would try to balance memory between the two tiers so that less often used memory would be located in the lower tiers. That requires tracking uh, sort of the hotness of the individual pages in the system. And you can uh, demote pages from the upper, higher, uh, upper tier to the lower tier if they're, if they're deemed cold, and you can promote pages from the lower tier to the hotter tiers. Uh, if you see that there's a lot of access is going to, to something which is located down here in the, in the colder storage. So that's more application transparent way of, of, of improving things. Now if you have these HMAT information and you can see, okay, we even have, uh, uh, we might have more layers here. There could be like storage class, byte addressable memory underneath here. That might still be interesting to have as part of the memory hierarchy. Uh, so there's some there's work going on on having multiple tiers of memory and assigning uh, different human nodes to a memory tier. So that's also something that potentially can be used at the application level. It's still a little bit unclear how to expose CXL memory in a good way to applications. Like maybe just having a human node is not the most user-friendly way of doing this. And what if you have multiple multiple numinos with different performance characteristics. So one way could be to have the memory tiers. There are other approaches as well suggested, maybe having specific flags for CXL memory, but still it doesn't really handle the heterogeneous nature of, of, uh, of CXL if you have multiple classes of memory attached through CXL. All right. So in QEMU, the focus was initially, the first implementation for QEMU was for supporting CXL 2.0, mostly coming from Intel. Um, well, ben Radavsky did the first implementation uh, as part of also validating the CXL 2.0 specification. Um, and for that, well, initially it only, s uh, or currently, at least upstream, that only supports persistent memory. CXL 3.0 is being worked on by several different uh, groups and people. Uh, volatile memory is being added, uh, and the multi-region support as well. Also on the operating system side in Linux, we're seeing more and more patches going in also in support for volatile memory, for example. Um, but Standard QMU was, at least until recently, uh, only uh, supporting persistent memory. So that's what we're going to look at. So for it's when you configure QMU, uh, we need to have some of the same components that we talked about before. So you have a, a host bridge, a CXL host bridge. It's based on a, sorry, we have the CXL host bridge. It, uh, you can program it with, uh, it has HDM decoders. It's tied to, uh, you assign it to a fixed memory window in, uh, that you need to define explicitly in QEMU. Then you can add root ports and uh, you can add a type 3 memory device which, device, which is the only thing that's currently supported by QEMU. So if we look at an actual configuration, you have the host bridge is implemented as a PCIe expander bridge. Uh, up here it's called CXL 1.1. You then define the fixed memory window uh, with a given size and say, okay, the one client or one child of the fixed memory window is a bridge. Then for the bridge, you configure it with ports. In this case, just a single port. Uh, called port one underscore one. Then you need to have some memory for your type three memory device. So you define a couple of memory objects backed by files. In this case, uh, you have regular, uh, the actual memory, and then you have the 
uh, label storage area memory. You then create the device using well, specifying a CXL Type 3 device and attach it to a root port and specify the, the memory devices. So that's a kind of a minimal configuration that should get you going. Um, Mia. But there are more advanced configurations. You can have uh, multiple root ports, I mean, uh, with different devices. You can have a, s a single switch. That's not really defined as a switch itself, but more you define an upstream port or upstream ports and downstream ports. Uh, boom. And then you can also do more advanced configurations with multiple host bridges. You can do interleaving across the host bridges if you want to experiment with that. Um, and that's about it in terms of different configurations. So we've been using it for quite a bit. It, it works fine, for at least for just a standard uh, memory. Uh, the memory uh, in CXL memory is implemented as uh, well using the MMIO support, so it means that whenever you access CXL memory, it's actually invoking a handler in the emulation layer to access the memory, uh, partly because there's a need to, to do the conversion between, well, it's one way to do the conversion between the, the host physical addresses and the device physical addresses. But it also means that when you were initially we were trying to just use the the tiered memory balancing, where you just have you can start executing code from CXL memory, then it turns out I mean all the all the accelerated the execution of uh, of of code doesn't I mean it doesn't really work if you have these memory handlers, so it needs to do use binary translation. Uh, yeah, yeah. And so, no use of KVM, and uh, we're so for now we're we're using CCG, and uh, of course, having a handler invoked on every memory access and using uh, binary translation for all your code execution is uh, is slowing things down when you do simula uh, emulation like that. Um, yeah, but. Other than that, the experience with interacting with the developer community is like they're very friendly and active. Uh, a lot of stuff is happening with CXL 3.0 uh, from Samsung, Huawei, uh, Memberge, and uh, Intel among the most active sort of groups. So we just take a look at once you have a system powered on and you, you want to check stuff with the uh, CXL, uh, there's a utility CXL CLI, which is uh, what you use for, for what you can use for, for setting up uh, CXL memory and uh, looking at what is in the system. So if you just powered on your s like the system we had before, uh, the simple one with the single memory device, so you can do a list of uh, of the active devices, you can see you have a single, single persistent memory device. You can also look at the decoders uh, in the system. Initially, you will have a decoders uh, program for the, for the accessing the host bridge. In this case, we allocated these four gigabytes of memory for the bridge. Um, and then you can set up if you want to create a memory region. You can. Use your memory device and say you want to attach that memory device to a uh, to a given decoder, or access it uh, through a given decoder, and then create a region. You then have uh, you program a, a decoder for accessing that that uh, memory device. Oh. Yeah, you can, I mean, for volatile memory, it depends a little bit, I mean, uh, but if you, yes, I mean, you can use it the same tool for volatile memory, but there's such some differences in how much of the configuration is done by the operating system, so you might not need to go through all the steps. Uh, but in this case, we have the, 
Now we have created the region for, for the persistent memory. We have, uh, it's mapped into this, uh, the address range, starting at the uh, mention up here. So you can, if you have, you just open, uh, for example, dev mem and, and start writing to that memory. You can see you can access the memory on the CXL device and uh, write stuff to it, read it back, whatever you want. Uh, even execute if you're doing binary translation, uh, maybe. So for, if you want to create the, or then have the, the persistent memory uh, attached as a, or exposed as a direct access device for persistent memory, you can also do that using the, the NVDIM control utility. You can create namespaces on the region and, and uh, then you have uh, the memory of the DAX device. And even if you want to start uh, with QEMU, if you want to play around with, uh, with having CXL memory as system memory, you can, uh, you can online it as system memory as well if you want. So that was, uh, that concludes the talk. Some thanks for particularly to AJ from WDC, who is uh, also very active in this, and then different resources. You can get the all the specifications and tutorials from the CXL com uh, Consortium website, and the also a nice documentation for QEMU. And there's also some blog posts over here if you want to experiment more with uh, setting up stuff in, uh, in Linux. Any yeah. Good. Yeah. So in in you had the case with the the, the switch or the fabric mm -hmm. between the different hosts. What was the physical cabling there? That's whatever. You, you just <laughs> imagine it's there. Or it's just super fast and uh, secret. <laughs> no, I mean. <laughs> It's it's on. I mean, that's uh, the idea is that you can have like a multi-switch fabric, right? But it's. I mean, we don't really know what it's actually going to look like. I mean, it's this is physical electrical. It's PCIe, yeah. so you will need something like that. I mean, so but who knows? But that might not be the fabric itself. It's not really part of the standard, as far as I know. Okay. So, but it's it, from it. it will, you basically put a wire into the PCI bus and put it into the switch and something yeah. like that. Yeah. And it doesn't exist yet, but that's okay. I don't. I mean, I don't remember. Sorry, I don't remember. I think it's uh, the, 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 the idea is that it like there's not that much uh, restriction on the actual um, fabric itself. But you need if you have switches, you need the routing capabilities of the the, the port-based routing capabilities and so on. So you need to. I mean, it is packets like CXL traffic flowing through the fabric, right? So. I don't know, I mean, it, if, it, it if you're required to do, maybe this, sorry, I mean, I'm not, actually not 100% sure, so I'll just, um, yeah. but but it, maybe it, it has to be PCIe yeah. in it, some it, form it or fashion. It looked like it was represented like a, a downstream port, that's how the abstraction was, and then you don't care, it, something will happen with that. Yeah. I mean, but it's definitely a challenge to build this kind of fabric, right? Yeah. So, something for you to do? No? <laughs> <laughs> So, so you said for uh, for volatile memory that the it is configured a lot by the BIOS. But could you use the the tools to request more memory, or it's, it's all request more memory, like <laughs> from some of the the pools? Like how yeah. is it? That's not the uh, like orchestration of the resources is not part of the spec. So you can't. I mean this. This is just for you. Think of it more like you have somebody else configuring devices for you, and then you can bring them. You can online. You can plug them in. And you can take them out. I mean, obviously, you could think that. The, think of it as there would be some some agent running on a host saying, "Okay, I would really, I could be more efficient if I had more memory," and then request it from somewhere, right? But that's not really. I mean, that's left as an exercise to the reader.
All right. uh, thanks a lot, Jared. And, yeah, you're uh, welcome. Talk about more memory next. <laughs>